This lecture, uh, the title of it, was prompted by uh, listening to the radio not so long ago in the car, uh, and the comment was made that in the UK this year, uh, Nissan have sold or will have sold 10,000 electric cars. Um, and that prompted me to think, well, why? Why would people buy an electric car? Um, I won't do any promotional work on the Bronte School Biofuels or Biodiesel project, I'll mention it briefly later. Um, but this did come up a couple of days ago in terms of a statement from G7. There is a recognition uh, that they're talking about the age of the fossil fuel coming to an end. Hmm. I love that bit here though. Their targets are not binding, uh, i.e. they won't necessarily stick to them. But what's certain in the longer term is that fossil fuels um, are going to get scarcer and scarcer. The time frame, who knows? So, this prompted me to look at you know, how we fuel our cars. Um, so, and it will be of interest, but one thing to be absolutely certain about is that we're not going to want to get rid of our cars, and so we need to make an educated choice as to what car we drive, we buy, what we use. And the choices are getting broader. I focused on cars rather than things like HGV vehicles, because hey, can you ever imagine them delivering goods with an electric HGV lorry? Hmm, difficult. Just how big will the battery pack be to do that job? So, um, I'm going to stick with cars because I think they'll be around for some time. Once you've had a car, it's very difficult to get rid of it. Anyone know why? Hmm? You need it. What's your alternative to a car? Walking. Walking or using? Public transport, yeah, correct. And depending on which part of the world and which city, cities are great. I lived many years in London, fantastic network, a bit crowded, but you could get from A to B anywhere across the city. There are a number of options, but if you want to get um, anywhere, just even within the West Midlands, you're a little constrained by the public transport. Okay. Can I fuel my car on water? Well, in theory, you could. What's wrong with that? Here's my water. Um, why can't I fuel my car on water? So there's about yeah, 800 millimetres there. What's wrong with water? Not is that reaction going to happen? No, the way it's written, it's a decomposition reaction. It will break down and magically give us hydrogen and oxygen. What's the norm in this process? How does it normally work, this equation? No, the other way around. So, that's clearly duffed, isn't it? But amazingly, some American sites, and it is an American site, you can get a water-powered car. This is waterpoweredcar.com. Um, not too sure about the science here, because if you read down here, but from H2 over we could heal the ozone. Now, anyone with a rudimentary knowledge of chemistry, even at sixth form level, knows that the ozone problem is not caused by primary pollutants, the burning of fossil fuels, per se. So, that's a bit iffy in terms of science. The even more frightening thing is when you delve a bit into this website, you just find out how they're fueling your car. But the only have a look at waterpowercar.com, it's frightening what they suggest you do under the bonnet of your car next to the engine to power your car. But there aren't people doing it. Okay, hydrogen from water is the key. Okay, but you've got to burn hydrogen, you've got to oxidise it. A one kilogram of hydrogen will produce three times the energy of a kilogram of petrol, of gasoline. That's about 1,400 cups of coffee from a kilogram of hydrogen. That's phenomenal. The technical term is energy density, it's the, it's the number of, it's the energy kilojoules per kilogram, which is a, a useful measure of how much energy you get from a fuel. Things like miles per gallon, kilometres per litre, um, industrial terms, in many other terms, your carrying mass. Formula One uh, cars would be concerned about the number of kilojoules they get from a kilogram of fuel. 
Okay, so that's the key. It's not from water, it's actually using water. It's somehow getting the hydrogen from water, and that's your problem. Okay, come back to that in a minute. If you look at fuels, in a sense, fuels are any materials that store potential energy uh, that can be released through oxidation. That could be chemical or electrochemical. I sort of added the electrochemical. But if you look at the global uh, situation in terms of energy consumption, this is where we were in 2010. It won't have changed much. 80% um, of the, our energy comes from fossil fuels. Okay, cars are a part of that. Whether it be home heating or cooking or industry, 80% comes from fossil fuels. And the other percentages are really, really small. Renewables, sub 20%. Nuclear, a very small percentage. Um, so that you put down there, it's really small. It's still fossil fuel. So what the G7 was suggesting just two days ago, that is a very difficult object objective. No wonder they made it non-binding. It's very difficult to see how they can do that in the space of, I don't know, 30, 40 years or so. Especially given that those were developed countries speaking. Anyone who has experience or comes from a developing country, what do you want? Anyone got a view? What do you want if you're a developing country? Cheap energy. Cheap energy. What else do you want? Hmm? Money to a certain extent. What do you want to do with your money when you've got it? Spend it on... Okay, first things you tend to buy if you're really from sort of ground up, you buy fridges, you buy cookers, then you buy cars. So car ownership in certain parts of the world is escalating. People want and aspire to own BMWs and Mercedes cars. Whatever sort of car. So the consumption in developing world will continue to increase. And it's all very well for the G7 to say, ooh, yes, we must stop doing this. But that's just seven, seven world powers in a sense. The rest of the world is quite keen on the idea of consuming. And so the challenge really, looking at a, at a small scale, just by looking at vehicles, because it's a much bigger picture, and I hope to sort of touch on that, is what could we do? Why should we buy one vehicle as opposed to another? Where are we going with this? So, what I propose to do, uh, why, well, first of all, why, do we, why should we care? It is generally accepted, except, except by former presidents of the United States of not so long ago, that carbon dioxide is in some way linked to global warming, which is not necessarily good. Anyone with a rudimentary GCSE uh, science background would know that it's not necessarily good for very cuddly looking polar bears. Okay, why not? Melting ice caps, there are problems with that. That then affects the oceans, that affects global weather patterns and so on. Um, and if you look, annoyingly fossil fuels seem to turn up as a source of major greenhouse gases. And our consumption of fossil fuels is continuing to rise. Uh, and really over the last 100, 125 years it has been almost exponential. So, we should care because this is having an environmental impact and it's storing up trouble for your children and your children's children. In one sense, I could sort of argue, I don't care. Why would that be, Nick? Because you're quite old. Because you're quite old, they'll love it. It doesn't mess about, it's just quite old, sir, so you don't need to worry about that. But there is a sense in which you should worry about your children and your children's children because it's not much of an inheritance if you've squandered resources. Right. What are your options? Well, I put it down to this. I think there are a few options. Direct use of fossil fuels, indirect, hybrid, hydrogen, and biofuels. Okay, before I sort of go through these a bit, uh, fossil fuels, I've got a few fossil fuels on the front here. Um, this is diesel. Mmm, delightful. This is biodiesel. Some of our very own, another plug. Uh, and this is uh, a simple hydrocarbon pentane, and this is methane. Everyone's come across methane, so if we light, get rid of the water, if we light them in turn, you can step, you can see the blind in the obvious, hopefully. Okay, the man with the gas tap, the man with the light burn. Okay, methane uh, is undergoing complete combustion. It's quite a clean flame. Uh, only when your average 
chemistry student does that, so if I can shut it off, do you get a yellow flame? And then you've got incomplete combustion, which we all know produces what? Principally, the problem with incomplete combustion is carbon uh, monoxide, which is a toxic gas. But worse than that, and I'll do demonstrate that in a minute with another fuel, but that's complete combustion, we let lots of oxygen in. If we go along the line, um, the next one's pentane, don't need on, sorry. We don't mind warming the place up with the British sun, we need the heat. Okay, so pentane. A little bit of yellow flame, but it's not producing, yeah, it's not that bad. Um, Bronsgrove School Biodiesel. Okay, that's, that's okay. The local Morrisons, don't know what sort of diesel this is, but... Ooh. There you go, standard hydrocarbon diesel. What's wrong with that? Lots, Lots of black stuff, what? Carbon, particulates. Um, very good for what sort of disease? Lung, lung disease, yeah, excellent for lung disease. Um, what you don't see um, are the other pollutants, the carbon dioxide, obviously. Um, but diesel there produced lots of carbon. You've got evidence of incomplete combustion. There will be some carbon monoxide having been given off in all four, um, but limited amounts, so don't worry, although it's a toxic gas. So, um, those are hydrocarbon based fuels. But these are our options. You either continue to use fossil fuels, diesel, petrol, methane, um, or you go for the electric option. Now, I'm being a bit naughty here because I've said indirectly of the use of fossil fuels, electric. Why am I being naughty? If you buy an electric car, is that brilliant? Are you helping the environment in the Western developed world? Why not? Because electricity, electric, all you're doing is moving the pollution, okay? Uh, if you like, it's indirect because you're still burning. Most of the UK's energy is produced and most Western developed countries still produce their energy using fossil fuels in one form or another. So, okay, to a certain extent, what is good about electric cars? Where would they be good? Where in the UK do you know it is really good to have an electric car? London, why not? Why is it good, sorry, to have an electric car in London? So that... It's a financial it's thing. No, you travel in short distances. You travel short distances, one thing, we'll come back to that later. What's the other thing? What do you have to pay if you want to travel into the centre of London in a oh, car? Taxes. The congestion charge. Okay, it's an interesting one. It's more like a fueling charge because if you've got a hybrid or you've got an electric vehicle, you don't pay. Okay? Which always been slightly interesting, pretty interesting in terms of the size of your hybrid car. But clearly, why is it good to have that sort of arrangement, have electric cars or hybrid cars potentially favoured in a metropolis like London? Yeah, the problem really is the pollution and the problem is very much to do with what sort of trips do people do in, in a vehicle in London. Very short trips. Or very slow trips. I think the average speed across London might be something like 12 to 13 kilometres an hour or so. So you're going very slowly and the pollutants tend to, to linger, you get photochemical smogs and all sorts of things. Okay? Uh, and the Americans sort of knew that in the early 1990s. Uh, in California because that's where we first started to see catalytic converters come in and hopefully limit the damage from some of the pollutants coming from fossil fuels. So, the indirect really talking about, there is still a problem with electric cars. We'll come on to other problems that you might have thought, thought of. There's the hybrid which is indirect and direct. You've got a mixture of both very popular at the moment. Um, hydrogen, ooh, not many of them around, okay? Potentially, what's good about hydrogen, though? Yeah, it is clean. Why is it clean? You did it earlier. The only product is water. So you're thirsty, you've been on a long drive in your hydrogen-powered car. It's hot, it's summer, you park it up, you need a drink, where do you get the water from? Your exhaust pipe, okay? It's novel, um, and you're sort of thinking, hmm, that may not work. <laughs> depending on what your hydrogen is going into, what the engine inverted commas in your car is. There are certain types of car that can still be a bit, maybe not. 
But we'll come back to that one later. And lastly on the list, you've got things called biofuels. There are a number of options in terms of biofuels, so we will touch on those. Okay, so I'm going to go through each of those, um, and hopefully we'll get some sort of interaction as to what your view on this and whether that makes sense or not. Okay, direct use of fossil fuel. Well, what have we got? Well, we've obviously got lots of fuel stations. Irridiculously, uh, there is just no way you should run out of fuel in the United Kingdom, is there? One, it's a small country. Uh, secondly, um, there is very short distance between fuel stations, even in the most remote parts of the country. I might take the point that if you live in parts of Australia, to a certain extent even the United States, and some parts of Europe, uh, you may have a problem because there might be greater distances between fuel stops. And if you're into outbound African adventures and you're going deep into the jungle, you carry your own fuel with you. But it's not a problem. It's your, it's your stupidity if you run out of fuel or anything else. There are lots of places to buy fuel. Uh, relatively easy and low distribution cost. Stick it in a tanker. Most of the fuel is what phase? Liquid. Uh, there is some uh, liquefied petroleum gas, but it never really took on, especially in the UK. Parts of Europe, Netherlands, to a certain extent, um, I think uh, France off the top of the head, and a couple of other countries, but not uh, widely. Um, it's applicable to a wide variety. We're focusing on cars because that's your area of interest. You're not likely to be driving an HGV. Anyone likely to be driving an HGV in the next five to ten years? Unless the university goes badly wrong. No? You might drive a van, but you're mostly going to aspire to owning a car. How many people are actually taking driving lessons at the moment? There's one or two, so I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are no range limitations, wide range of service options. What do I mean? There is anybody, and there are lots of people available with a spanner in hand uh, and an oily rag and a pair of overalls who will offer to fix your car. Obviously that doesn't become a problem unless you have an older car. Um, otherwise, obviously it's covered by a warranty and you go to very nice dealerships where there are marble floors and it's all wonderful. But otherwise, easy service. You can go in any garage and they can probably fix it. Because uh, you generally can't nowadays, why not? Too complicated. They're quite complicated. If you've ever driven in a road on a road anyway, what do it seems to be a man thing? Or what do men seem to do if their car breaks down? Hit it. Now have you ever seen them by the roadside? What do they do? Open them up and just look inside. Ooh. And then ring uh, the recovery service. So, but there are a wide range of services. Anyone can fix them. Doesn't really matter. There are lots of lots of garages. No problem at all. It's proven and developing. Um, there is a link on this. I won't use it. But this is the T25 city car. I'll come back to that in a second. What most car manufacturers are doing is making the car engines, the internal combustion engine, what? What do you think they're doing to it? More efficient. More efficient. Smaller. Um, much more power from a small engine. Frightening to think that even the likes of Ford and BMW have three-cylinder engines. I don't know if it'll take off in America where everything has to be 12 cylinders or something, or V8, I don't know. But ridiculously small and also able to go, you know, many miles to the gallon or kilometres to the litre. The T25 city car is an interesting one. Um, in the last couple of months, Shell have announced they're working with Gordon Murray. Uh, anyone know who Gordon Murray is? He's a car designer. He was behind uh, the McLaren F1 team, which isn't doing so well at the moment, but go back five to ten years, and McLaren as an F1 team were reigning supreme, and he was the designer behind the F1 uh, team, and he's in collaboration with Honda, who are working with Shell, to develop the internal combustion engine. So recently in a run down to Brighton, this was averaging, this small vehicle with three seats was averaging about 100 miles to the gallon. Now, you've got to be careful when you listen to car manufacturers saying, yes, but the, my Skoda or my Volkswagen can do that. Well, not necessarily. They, are, they do play uh, fast and loose with the way that miles per gallon figures are worked out. But they see a future for more and more interesting and modern technologies being used to build cars. They're getting lighter and lighter, <coughs> and they're using smaller and smaller engines that use less and less fuel. Okay, and again, Petrol's got a very high fuel density. It also has an advantage over hydrogen. What's the problem with hydrogen and gases? What have you got to do to make it viable? 
Why aren't you allowed to have LPG cars running through the through the Euro tunnel? Yeah, the compressive gas. And there's still a concern that if there is a fire, you have gas cylinders with pressurized gas and there's a risk of explosion. Less problematic if you've got petrol. So if you're planning to drive across to Europe, you shouldn't be, you can't drive probably, well certainly bulk of a hydrogen powered car, maybe, probably haven't had one tried to do it yet, but certainly LPG, petroleum gases, would what you do. Pollutants are still problematic though. Um, and there's a little line at the bottom there. In built up areas, for the first five kilometers, you are throwing out carbon monoxide, you're putting out NOx, nitrogen oxides, uh, and, un and potentially unburnt hydrocarbons, which could get into the mix with some sunlight and produce smog, photochemical smog. None of that is good for your health. So, in built up city areas, even this as a city car is probably going to come across a cropper against electric cars. Yeah? Right, so that's fossil fuels. We've already seen that there are problems with fossil fuels and the way they burn. Okay, what's the next one? What other options have we got? Okay. Indirect use. Electric cars. Um, show you a little skit. Here's an electric car working at its best. They're no longer naff. Things and there are some even not so far away. Also, there's one in Malvern, which is about uh, 10 15 kilometers away or so. There is a bank of recharging stations, nobody ever seems to be parked in them, uh, but they are limited. Uh, I said they're quiet, safety concerned, limited range, okay, not great. And depending on how you drive, what happens to your range? Decreases. What else might you have to use in the summer? Not in the UK because it's never that warm. What might you have to use inside your car that's going to take energy? Air conditioning. Air conditioning yeah. Uh, and the other thing, because you're getting a bit bored, is that you want to do what else in the car? Radio. 
radio, well, probably not the radio, it's a bit old hat, but you've probably got your iPhone linked to your Bluetooth to the, the system through the speakers, um, and you're listening to music. So all of these things uh, are going to use up the electricity, okay? And if it rains, you've got to break the wipers. If it's nighttime, you've got to have the lights on. So all of these things affect your range. The range they publish, of course, is under ideal conditions. The sun is out, but not too hot. There's no strong wind. You don't have any built-up traffic. You're not on the M5 in the UK on a Friday evening. So, limited range. High emission cars, they're not cheap. The UK government has subsidised. Other government, governments have subsidised cars to the tune of £5,000. Was it worth buying one? Limited service options. Guess who can service you? Nissan Leaf. Nissan, Nissan dealers. Okay? You, sir, need some new batteries. Um, and the concerns about battery life. There's also a little concern about what batteries are made of, disposal, just how green is it? Measured carbon footprint. I've not touched on this, and it's one to think about. When they look, people look at buying cars, do they, what do they consider? Well, mostly it's price. Um, and that might be related to the, in the UK to the amount of tax you pay, which is the number of, if you like, the CO2 rating, just how much carbon dioxide comes out of the exhaust pipe. So guess what your car tax on the Nissan Leaf is? Absolutely nothing. Brilliant. But how much carbon are you? What is your carbon footprint? Because you're getting the electric, electrical energy from somewhere. Okay? You're getting it from the grid. And 90% of UK production of electricity is produced from fossil fuels. The other thing, just how expensive, what's the carbon footprint of the car? The manufacture, the use and the disposal of the car, i.e. over the life of the car, just how much carbon is used. Think about it, how do you make a car in a car plant? What do you use? Lots of energy in terms of the materials that it's made of, the battery packs that are assembled, so it's a little bit of a cheat in a sense. In one sense, are you that green by purchasing um, an electric car? Okay, so there are a number of things to worry about electric cars. Firstly, it's not terribly cool looking. Has anyone seen the BMW i8? Yeah. That's a hybrid. So maybe it's a better option we look at that. Okay, hybrid options. I deliberately didn't put the i8 there because we just spend the next five minutes, if you're male and under the age of 25, looking at the item, I want one of those, okay? Uh, seriously cool looking car. Uh, this is a RAV4, it's a Toyota, it's a hybrid. They're expensive. Um, they have advantages and disadvantages. They are complex. What's a hybrid consist of? Both an uh, internal combustion engine, some description, normally quite small, augmented by what? An electric motor, which needs a large number of batteries. Why is that a good idea? Okay. Well clearly, if you're living in London, why is a hybrid a really good idea and you're really well off? And I said to John T, yeah, for example. Uh, he's got um, a little cottage in the West Country. He's going down to Cornwall every weekend. During the week he's moving around London in his hybrid i8 or whatever. It might be a RAV4 because he's got three kids by this time. We're talking 10 years since. Possible. Um, Brown town in London, not paying a congestion charge, brilliant. Weekend, off down the motorway, no range problems. He's got a mix, he's got a, an internal combustion engine and the battery pack. So hybrids are the thing at the moment. Lots of manufacturers have or are producing hybrid cars. So, anyone got, anyone, anyone, parents got one, friends got a hybrid? Anyone with a hybrid car? No experience at all? Okay, that's the i3. The generation of mobility, the BMW i3 Concept Coupe, the first purely electric powered model from the BMW i brand. It's an interesting purely electric, so they've got a motor. Integral concept, far beyond zero emission driving. The car is almost four meters long, the trunk holds 200 liters. The elegant flowing coupe line and the stream flow design convey its lightness, transparency, and aerodynamics. Silent, relaxed driving and a range of up to 160 kilometers. The BMW i3 concept accelerates from 0 to 60 kilometers per hour in just okay. seconds. Not sure the range is that brilliant. Um, 
But that's the sort of thing. The cars are not looking weird. A few years ago, anyone in the UK used to watch Top Gear, no longer um, a runner because of a certain member of the Top Gear team having overstepped the mark. But they tested an uh, electric car and absolutely took the mickey no end because they really were very bad. Now they sort of electric and hybrid cars look like normal cars. Okay, so the RAV4, the latest offering from Toyota, has just been launched. It's a hybrid. Um, and it looks like a normal car. It's no longer weird looking. Okay, this is the interesting one, hydrogen. Um, hydrogen cars run on hydrogen. They only produce water. Okay, there's no infrastructure yet. People are playing with them. There's research. The Honda, Toyota, Hyundai, they're all looking at hydrogen. Um, they are obviously expensive. This is the new Toyota Mira. There's a little um, film clip in a minute. We'll show you Toyota's latest offering. Uh, they're a bit like electric cars, unless hydrogen can be sourced from non-fossil fuel sources. Here's the thing. Honda have even suggested that you can reform methane in the home to make hydrogen. Why is that daft? You take methane to make hydrogen. Well, what's methane? What type of fuel is it? A hydrocarbon fossil fuel. So currently the word, a lot of methane is either you can get from natural gas, but a lot of it is reforming, it's a process of reacting hydrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, to produce methane. So they're sort of nonsensical to take a hydrocarbon, a fossil fuel, and turn it into hydrogen. But if you can source it from non-fossil fuel uses, brilliant. Where can we get, before we come to that, where can we get hydrogen from? We can get it from, coming back to the original topic, water. What do we do to water? Electrolysis. Electrolysis. So, here's the electrolysis of water. It's pretty weird, but there's water is in these, in these tubes. Here's a plus and minus electrodes. What I'm going to do is turn the power off and we'll collect some gas. In theory. Fizzing is going on. Now, I'm not going to check whether you can remember this from your GCSE years or not, but we could risk it. Nick. Looking confused. Anyone like to volunteer? This is a positive electrode. So what gas is coming off a positive electrode when you pass an electric current through water? Oxygen. And on the negative, we must have hydrogen. The neat thing about this, when you get the gas volumes collected, what ratio are they in? Twice as much hydrogen to oxygen. The ratio in the formula is H2O. It's about ratio of numbers of atoms or in this case that relates directly to volume. So this is electrolysis. So brilliant. All we've got to do is electrolyze water. What's the problem in the UK with doing that? What are we using to electrolyze our water? Electricity. From burning of fossil fuels. Um, where could you do this? What source of energy would potentially be brilliant for electrolyzing water? Solar. Any of the alternatives, right? If you like the green options, you can look at uh, what? Geothermal, hydro, solar, tidal, you name it. All the alternative sources of energy would be brilliant. It's not quite that simple. We've had to tweak the water slightly to get it to, to work. It's got, uh, there are some ionic solid been added and dissolved to make the water uh, more likely to break up into hydrogen and oxygen. But we'll carry on filling. We'll just check um, that we have actually made some hydrogen in a second. But we'll carry on letting that fill up. So electrolysis is a means of getting uh, hydrogen core sourced from non-fossil fuel sources. Okay? Using electrolysis or any other green source of energy. In fact, when um, when I think it was Mercedes that trialled the use of the electric smart cars in the UK a few years ago, they insisted, and they went to big companies, you can't buy one, I don't think, it's a pity, they insisted the companies using the smart cars, they put them into a lot of large corporate establishments, they must say they were getting their electric electricity from a green or source, uh, they were taking it from solar, uh, how they did that I have no idea, but they insisted that on the back of the electric smart car, they have that sticker. It's been sourced from the green source. Okay, um, hydrogen can use a conventional internal combustion engine. Remember that funny website, it was Power Your Car, Water.com, I mean, water or whatever it was earlier? Um, they 
have injected hydrogen gas into a normal combustion engine, internal combustion This is the frightening pack bit. They had, um, you know what a coffee jar is? Yep. They had filled the coffee jar with water, which had been slightly ionised with an ionic compound, in fact bicarb of soda, baking powder. Uh, they then had electrodes connected to the car battery, producing hydrogen and oxygen, okay? And the hydrogen was then injected into the car engine. Now I'm sort of thinking, glass coffee jar with lid, electrodes connected to car battery alongside an internal combustion engine under your bonnet, or hood if you're American. Frightening. But that's what they were doing as, as a way of producing hydrogen fuel that cheap. Um, certainly not that, but you can run an internal combustion engine on hydrogen fuel. What's the alternative? What are these guys? A fuel cell. Brilliant idea. Why are fuel cells good? When, when were fuel cells, when did they first come to the fore, fuel cells? You've got to go back a bit. If you're American, it might help. Anyone American? It doesn't help. When did fuel cells first come to the fore? When, when did they become crucial? The American space program used fuel cells because if they could electrolyze water, they would produce oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen could be used as a fuel potentially, but oxygen is important uh, for other reasons. Also, when you're looking at space exploration, why are they so keen to find water? Well, obviously, it sustains life, but potentially, uh, if you've got plenty of access to solar, you can generate hydrogen, which is a fuel. So the neat thing about um, a fuel cell, it's a very small diagram, let's not focus too much, it's basically got a polymer electrolysis membrane. It basically is an electrochemical process which causes water, okay, or any fuel, sorry, uh, not water, any fuel, hydrogen in this case, to combine with oxygen to produce electrical energy. And there is no waste product. Just how good this is, um, this is quite a nice bit. This is this states from a couple of days ago. It's quite recent stuff. If I take a bit on this one. This is the Toyota Mirai. That means the future. And Toyota would like us to believe that this car is the future because it is the world's first mass-produced hydrogen fuel cell car. So, what is it like? This is just a couple of days old, posted on the BBC News website. So what's it like in here? Well, it's actually really nice. It's comfortable, it's quiet, it's incredibly smooth. And the real point about this car is the technology. It doesn't give you what's called range anxiety. I can drive 300 kilometers on one charge of hydrogen. At the moment, it's telling me I can go another 280 kilometers before I have to stop and refuel. That's really different from other zero emissions vehicles. On the downside, this car is very expensive. 60,000 US dollars for this base model. That's about the same as a Mercedes-Benz or a large BMW. And I don't know, maybe it's my taste, but it's not much of a looker. So that's the other thing about this car that's different. It's very quick to refill it with hydrogen. So we've come to a station. Let's see how long it takes. That's it, I and mean, that barely took a couple of minutes. Hardly enough time to finish my coffee. Let's go. According to the advertising, the only thing this car produces is water. So let's see. Tastes like water. But the fuel this car uses, hydrogen, it takes a lot of energy to make, a lot more to store, and more still to transport around the country. So the critics say this car is not nearly as clean as it's claimed to be. Okay. So, what you see there is, 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 is certainly interesting, but obviously there are some problems with the infrastructure, um, and obviously the manufacture, the making of hydrogen, that is a real problem. Just how do you make your hydrogen? How green is it? But it comes back to the electric car argument. How do you generate the electricity to run your electric car? 
So really, lots and lots of scope for future developments to see how this might become uh, a real viable option. The neat thing about fuel cells, by the way, this is, this is our very own little fuel cell car. I have no idea if I've charged it properly, but hey. Uh, it's got a clumsy tank, it's got some oxygen, there you go. It's got a little motor and it sort of moves around a bit. It's going to go off the table as well. So they go fine. Don't let it go over the edge. So that's basically running on. It's got hydrogen and oxygen produced by electrolysis. It has little stores of each of these. It's not a great design, I will admit. But, but that's basically producing water as, a, uh, as the only product and it's running on hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? And the key thing is that little piece of technology is the fuel cell. And what in a car, what you have is a bank of these. And they have no moving parts. So what you've got, effectively, is a low maintenance option. Um, it will have some sort of uh, polymer-based membrane, it's a bit like a catalyst. It's there, it's not going to get degraded, provided you don't. And they will run on different fuels. If some of them will, will code with methane, produce carbon dioxide and water, which isn't great. Depends how you source your methane. How could you source your methane to be sustainable? Hmm? From cows, I left it cows. <laughs> well, I've got 25 cows in my garden, I've got methane. I'll come back to cows later because it's a good point. So, the really neat thing, and it's not really on there, is that look at, you have a whole bank of these, there are no moving parts. Um, clearly, in terms of the fuel cell. Clearly the electricity has to go through an electric motor. But the idea of using hydrogen in an, an internal combustion engine hmm, pales into insignificance in terms of its viability compared with using a fuel cell. Why? Because internal combustion engines are quite complex, they need more maintenance. Uh, and so a lot of thought going into hydrogen fuel cells. Okay, um, I'll just stop this see if we've actually got any hydrogen. If we've got hydrogen, uh, we'll check um, on some innocent individual to test whether we've got hydrogen. There you go. So I'm going to see if we can test for hydrogen. You've got to remember which one is hydrogen. That's one person. Okay, you're going to test for hydrogen. Okay, here's what do you need? There you go, match. Have a spoon. Do you want a trusty assistant with you? There you go. Right, um, now, do you do physics? No, okay. So you have to stand up and come here because otherwise it's going to be a problem. Um, you've got to decide how you're going to get the hydrogen into your test tube. Oh, nice. So, uh, this is obviously, which was red, red one was oxygen, that's your hydrogen, not solid. So how are you going to get the hydrogen into your test tube? It's an issue to test. No pressure, you just hold the spoon. You can do that with you. Give it a... Right, no problem. Right, how are you going to do that? Let's get rid of that. Anyway, that's just your hydrogen's in here. Yeah. What do you know about hydrogen gas? It's less dense. It's less dense. Okay, so how are you going to collect it in that test tube? <laughs> Over the tap. When do you stop collecting it? So you can line your mouth your splint if you want. Right, so you've got to get your hydrogen in there. Stick it at the top, and when do you stop? Watch that level. Get a bit more in there. And don't tip the test tube over, but just carry it vertically across the flame. There you go. Yeah. One pop, hydrogen. Well done, thank you. Big round of applause, two top demonstrators. <laughs> okay, we can be more extreme. Um, one of the concerns about hydrogen is it's an explosive gas. It's not going to be good, is it, if we have hydrogen in our cars? I'm going to like this first. Um, so, we can do this because it's... Oh dear. Um, right, so um, there are some concerns, however... Um, a lot of people are concerned about storing hydrogen in cars, but obviously the fuel tanks will not be flimsy plastic affairs. There's another cost associated with storing the fuel on a car, transporting it around the country, and also having the infrastructure. There are major questions to be considered. Okay? Right, hydrogen cars. 
Another option, biofuels. Um, annoyingly, someone said to me, well, surely um, diesel, fossil fuels have had their day. Yes, but not necessarily biofuels. You go back 10, 15 years, the Americans got heavily into biofuels. A lot of other countries as well, they were using palm oil. Uh, they were also making bioethanol from uh, corn and so on. Hence, food prices went up. Land was being devoted to produce fuels rather than food. Uh, and that was first generation biofuels. If you grow what uh, plants that could be used for fuel and turn them into a biofuel, then your tank, that's not great. Second generation is using the waste, so back to the cows. Okay? So, what we can use here, we can use food waste, farm slurry, chicken litter, abattoir waste, waste food. And in theory, there was a project in the UK not so long ago where a complete housing estate uh, had a biomass generator. Guess where they sourced the stuff from? We don't need to go into detail. But everything that went down the drains that was organic, so it's like you have your McDonald's burger. To a certain extent, it goes into the system, there's some recycling, you get back some methane. And so there's a lot that can be done with biofuels. Methane was then, in a sense, a biofuel. It had been produced from waste. Now, obviously, you've got to be careful not to burn as much fuel making your biofuel uh, as you get from the biofuel. But second generation is very much looking at doing something clever with the waste. Apparently, the school has access to a biodigester. Maybe the dining hall apparently sends their waste somewhere. So clearly, that's second generation. But third generation, anyone come across third generation biofuels? <coughs> they make them? Plants that aren't terribly useful. Non-food plants, like algae. Lots of research by biochemists in the looking at algae. And there's even a fourth generation, but I haven't gone on to that yet. That's obviously even beyond second. At the moment, we're into potentially second generation. The first generation has, to a certain extent, uh, had its reputation sullied by the, by the effect upon the growth of food. Okay, so that's biofuel, which is still a hydrocarbon-based fuel, whether it be ethanol, methanol, uh, biodiesel, or whatever, it's still hydrocarbon-based, it's still got carbon and hydrogen, it will still produce carbon dioxide. But the idea is that to grow plants and the like, they take in the hydro, so it's carbon neutral in theory. Okay? So that's biofuels, that's the other option. Okay. Come back to the uh, energy density and meaningful comparison. You can see that lithium batteries in the number of kilojoules, uh, megajoules, sorry, per kilogram, lithium batteries are not great. Battery technology is a real problem. I know they're working on smarter and smarter batteries, but if you're going to power a vehicle, you need a significant current. The power that you've got to have on board has got to be significant. I know that they're getting better at charging. The latest phase is that you're, what, what the biggest problem you have with charging? What item of, that you have requires a fast charge? The phone. And they're getting to the stage where the next generation of phone charging means you just put it on a pad and it just charges in minutes, which would be brilliant because one of the most annoying things after about two years owning a, fill, a, a phone is what? Why your battery? It starts to degrade and it doesn't hold as much charge, it's really, really annoying. And within about sometimes a day, day and a half, your battery is dead and it's really infuriating. Uh, so, definitely, uh, you can see there's a problem with battery technology, they're working on it. But look, all of these, nowhere near like, as good as hydrogen. Hydrogen has three times the energy per kilogram. So all the other options, whether it be crude oil, kerosene, aviation fuel, gas, gasoline, petrol, or, or even coal, clearly wood and ethanol are quite low. Um, but that was just an interesting comparison. Okay, what about future trends? Okay, these are three statements. Uh, one of them is very new. Uh, a new. Um, we have to look at the way upstream, all the way upstream, produce the fuel in a low carbon way. That's the important. Where did we get our electricity from? Secondly, big companies are looking at hydrogen power. Seriously looking at hydrogen power. Uh, there's another one here. Keys to new energy economy. Relying on solar and wind power rather than fossil fuels. There's a limit to what we can do with human waste. 
It is not going to power the UK or the US economy. I don't think. But it could augment the power supply. The largest reduction of oil demand will come from improved fuel economy. That's what's going to happen in the next 15 to 20 years. It's what they're doing with the internal combustion engine and the cars you drive. So even major motor manufacturers like Ford, for example, produce little three-cylinder engines in their latest version of the Ford Focus that has 1.2 litres. It's not doing you much good for the machismo. You sidle up in your Ford 1.2. The good thing is insurance costs are what if you've got a 1.2 litre engine? Okay. Low. In theory, unless they work out that actually the thing will do 130 miles per hour, so maybe it's not that great. But the key thing, the engines are getting smaller, so you don't have a big V8 with 5 litres on board. So I'm not sure about the machismo bit, but clearly that's where lots of, that's 10 or so years, 10, 15 years, lots of effort there. There will be electric cars, but my bet is that sometimes someone's going to have to look at doing something seriously with hydrogen cars. They're starting to look at it. So what about your future, sort of coming to a close really? There are a mixture of options for your fuel in your car. You need to take a measured and careful decision. Where do you live? If you're working in central London and you need to travel the country, buy a hybrid, probably. If you're not going to leave central London and you still think, oh, it would be useful to have a personal mode of transport to get me out to the suburbs, get me to a match on, on Sunday, or whatever, get me about 50 miles outside of London, then probably electric, unless you to just take taxis or use the tube, okay? Otherwise, if you're living in Worcestershire, here, there's not much of a charging infrastructure, to be honest. Maybe you're better off buying, at the moment, a car that has very modern technology in terms of its internal combustion engine, and you're stuck with petrol, possibly diesel, but maybe less so diesel, there are concerns with diesel. Okay, the one thing that I wanted to do, really, because I've got a captive audience, very exciting time to be involved in design, development, and production of new fuel systems and new modes of transport. What type of company makes money? Bankers shuffle money around. Economists trying to work out where it's all went, where it's all gone. But the real, uh, the real future is basically in the technocrats, definitely in the develop developing world, to design and build. Uh, products that people want and people will always want personal modes of transport. There's some fantastic opportunities to work in design, development, production of new modes of transport. I've focused on the car but it's seriously whatever your technical bias, I'm not saying there isn't a place for those that are going to be bankers and economists or whatever, but if you have an inkling to be work on the technical side, even on the design side, you know, the aerodynamics, for example, the shape of the car is so important. You know, the material science involved. Uh, there's a fair amount of chemistry. There's, there's clearly engineering. There's clearly physics. There are lots of, there's lots of scope for what I call the technocrats. Because without the technocrats, a lot of what we have just won't happen. So it's really to encourage you to look at this as possible options for your future. I don't know where you want to go, I don't know what you want to study. Uh, where you see yourself going. But if you look at the really exciting developments, then clearly, modes of transport, you're going to see a revolution the like of which people have not seen for a long time. If I go back, you know, X number of years, and unfortunately I'm talking decades here, nothing much has really changed in terms of car transport. Okay? Even we had electric cars. Okay, they were milk floats. They went at five miles an hour and delivered milk to the home. Okay? But the chances are you will see a rapid, an accelerating mode, series of changes in this area, and it'd be a very exciting area to get involved in, if that in any way excites you. Any questions? All going very silent. Yeah? It was just an idea just to provoke some thoughts. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, it's an area, if, if I had my time again, which is a bit, a bit restricted, it's definitely an area I have great interest in and will get involved in. I think it's tremendously exciting. And there are a lot, there's lots of scope in the UK, in the States, in Europe to get involved with major companies, whether they be the oil giants who are now turning themselves into, guess what, energy companies, or the major manufacturers of vehicles who have to look to the future. Okay, thank you very much.